This is lecture number three in a series of eight lectures on the doctrine of Satan. And thus far we've looked at Satan's existence and his origin, his personality, and some of his names, and then the various activities given this uh, false prophet in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The various activities. We said that he imitates God, and there are ten things that we discussed under that. He has a false trinity. He has his synagogues. He has his doctrines. He has his mysteries, as God does his throne. And he has his kingdom. Uh, our Lord, uh, during the experience with Jesus in the, uh, the desert there, the temptation, we read, He said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. In other words, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and he offered to give these kingdoms to, to the Lord. Now, theologians have argued over whether Jesus, or actually whether Satan, had the right to do this. Does Satan actually have the kingdoms of this world? Well, of course, he doesn't own them, as it were. I mean, God is still the sovereign ruler of all kingdoms, and the Bible says that the things that, that the kingdoms and the powers that be are ordained of God. But in another sense of the, world, uh, of the word, Satan does have access to these kingdoms, and in a sense, he could, at least, uh, like we say again, in the sense of the word, give them to Jesus. And, uh, but he has his kingdom. And so, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, so Satan has his kingdom. And then he has his worshipers. In Revelation 13, verse 4, <clears throat> speaking of the unsaved that will live during the tribulation, And they worshipped the dragon, who gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast. Now, that's the Antichrist saying, who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? A very significant passage in the Bible is found in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And our Lord is discussing theology, and actually the plan of salvation, with a very immoral Samaritan woman. And uh, so she gets in a conversation about uh, the matter of worship. And she said, well, now you Jews say that at that time she did not recognize him as a Messiah until a little later on. But she said, you Jews say that you ought to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. But we Samaritans, years ago, we built a temple on Mount Gerizim here, and you can see it uh, from Jacob's well, even today. And uh, so we feel that we ought to worship on Mount Gerizim. Now, where should people worship God? And our Lord turned to this Samaritan woman and said, The hour cometh, and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And he goes on to say, of course, in that beautiful verse in John 4.24, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But sometimes that first verse in 23 is overlooked here. He said, For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now think of this. The God of this universe desires men to worship him. He demands angels worship him. And he requires demons to acknowledge him but he wants men to worship him. And if a man refuses to worship God, then he will indeed worship Satan. Man is incurably religious. Man must worship something or someone. So Satan has his worshipers, those who will not worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he has his angels and he may have millions and millions of these angels. Demons, of course, are, as I understand the Bible, simply fallen angels. And we don't know how many angels originally existed before a number decided to rebel against God, but there possibly was trillions. The Bible speaks of uh, 
thousands and ten thousand times, ten thousand and thousands and thousands, and so there's hundreds of millions of angels. And as I say, there may even be trillions of angels. The reason I say this is because in Mark chapter 5, our Lord Jesus talked to a man who was demon-possessed, and this man had, I may have covered this subject before, and uh, this man had 6,000 demons in him. Now, he was just a peasant, and if the devil could, uh, you know, uh, waste, as it were, could spare uh, five or 6,000 angels, in the body of a relatively very unimportant man, he may have millions and millions to spare. But at any rate, he has his angels, and he has his ministers. Uh, Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, a great Presbyterian Bible teacher that uh, died some years ago, uh, once said, when you get ready to look for the devil, don't forget to check behind the pulpit, because many of Satan's most successful activities and speeches come not from a tavern or from a communist cell meeting, but from behind the pulpit. In fact, Adolf Hitler did a lot of things. He was a murderer and a Jew killer, hater, but one thing he was not, he was not an atheist, and Hitler never invented the God is Dead movement. That did not come from Adolf Hitler or Nikita Khrushchev. It did not come from any known atheist in the uh, secular world. It came from a minister. It came from a Methodist minister. Now, it could have been a Baptist minister or it could have been a Presbyterian, but it, in this case, it was a Methodist minister. So he has his ministers. And Paul speaks about this in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing, speaking of Satan now, if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So he has his ministers, some that pretend to be faithful to God, uh, men like J.J. Uh, Altizer, men we could already mentioned, the inventor of the God is Dead movement, and uh, men like Harry Emerson Fosdick, uh, who denied the book and the blood and the blessed hope, uh, men like J. Preston Bradley, uh, who for many years was pastor of the People's Church in Chicago, Illinois. I heard Mr. Bradley on radio while I was up there attending Moody a number of years ago, and he was uh, speaking, uh, had a had a good message on social reform. He was a good speaker, no doubt about that. And the end of the message, uh, I thought he was really going to give an invitation. He said, listen, he said, I know thousands of you out there are listening to my voice. And he said, I just believe that there may be someone, some dear person, and you're about ready to give up. You're up to here, up to your chin, as it were, in sorrows and, and discouragements, and uh, you may even be contemplating suicide. And he said, listen, he said, I have the answer. You know what he said? Go fishing. <laughs> that's, all, that's right. Take a day off from, from uh, your busy work. You're just, you know, uh, you're just working too hard. And go out and catch a few fish and everything will be all right. And on another occasion, he said, listen, you out there, he said, have you come to the end of your rope? He said, friend, I have an answer. Tie a knot and hang on. Well, that was the message of Mr. Bradley. And that's the message of Satan's ambassadors. That may be good advice on occasion. I'm not saying that's not good advice, but I'm saying that when a man stands behind a pulpit and receives money from God's people and then concludes his invitations in like manner to these two illustrations, he is not the minister of God. Because the Apostle Paul said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. G-O-S-P-E-L. That's the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So he has his ministers. Then he has his miracles. Now, can Satan do miracles? He certainly can. The Bible indicates this. Second Thessalonians 2, during the tribulation, 
that uh, many will believe the workings of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And in the Old Testament, uh, we're told that when Moses performed miracles before Pharaoh, remember Moses' uh, staff that he carried with him when he was confronted by Pharaoh, uh, turned into a serpent. And the Egyptian magicians did the same. They turned their uh, staffs in their sticks, as it were, into serpents. And then, of course, uh, Moses' serpent outstaged theirs because he swallowed them up. But the thing I'm trying to point out is that apparently Satan can perform miracles. Now, I don't want to get bogged down on this, but I believe that he can perform healings. I think it's logical that he can. For example, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt, as in the case of Job, and then in the New Testament, our Lord Jesus uh, healed a woman on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees jumped all over him, and he said, Listen, uh, why should not I heal this woman whom Satan, this daughter of, of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound these 18 years with his physical infirmity. Now, hey, listen, do you know I can heal? That's right. I can guarantee I can heal you of the worst headache you ever had. I'll tell you how I can do it. You want to come down and see me, and uh, you come on into where I am. I'm going to take a hammer, and I'll just begin to uh, start uh, hitting your head with that hammer. And uh, that'll give you a headache, won't it? I mean, to be hit on the head a uh, number of times with a ball-peen hammer is going to give a person a headache. And then suddenly I'm going to miraculously cure that headache, and I'll just simply cease hitting you on the head with that hammer. And presto, your miracle uh, takes place, your deliverance is affected, and your headache is gone. But I'm saying that if Satan can bind believers and non-believers, as apparently he can, like the woman in the New Testament, like the book of Job tells us, with physical afflictions, then he can heal them simply by uh, withdrawing this evil uh, knocking of the soul, as it were, the, uh, the physical affliction that he's put on in the first place. What I'm trying to say is that I think uh, there are Christian science practitioners who report miraculous healings, and I think probably people are healed, not from the Lord, but through the activities of Satan, because he can work miracles. And then uh, the Roman Catholics, uh, they have the miracle Lourdes, and other in France, and other miracle, miraculous uh, uh, places where that you can visit, and, and there's a pile of crutches and wheelchairs people have thrown away, and they miraculously been healed. Well, maybe that happened. And then various faith healers today. I uh, knew a man, I was in his meeting in Texas, and, uh, well, his name is A.A. A. Allen. This all came out in the newspapers, and I talked to some people there, and they said, you know, you can say what you want about that man, but he had healed my grandmother, a person told me that in the meeting, and, and another person said, he healed me. It wasn't just uh, a grandmother. He healed me of something. And maybe he did. I don't know. Well, what kind of man was A. A. Allen? Well, it is known to be a fact that when he, uh, uh, some time ago, he died under mysterious circumstances in a, a Los Angeles uh, motel room, and no one was present at the time of death, and so the coroner of Los Angeles County uh, examined him and did an autopsy and found that he died of sclerosis of the liver. He was drunk at the time he died, and uh, he had been on drugs for a number of years, and he left an estate of some six million dollars, according to U.S. News and World Report magazine. And so uh, I, I'm not sure we could conclude a man uh, who would leave a fortune like that on drugs uh, all of his pretty well most of his life and, and uh, drunk at the time of his death was exactly a man of God. And yet, apparently he did perform miracles. So we need to be uh, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And uh, some are uh, wise as doves and harmless as serpents. I think they've twisted it around. Believers need to know these facts that Satan has his miracles. Satan can perform miracles. Uh, one more 
uh, thought along that line. In the book of Revelation, I hadn't even considered bringing this out, but let me uh, turn to Revelation chapter uh, 13, I believe it is. During the tribulation itself, we're told that the Antichrist, verse 13, he doth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do. And uh, so apparently he has and will have great miraculous working power. Some have said that by bringing fire down from heaven, he may imitate Pentecost. There may be another Pentecost. This modern charismatic movement, I think, is moving toward that, where that uh, everybody's speaking in tongues. And, and uh, so here, this may be a charismatic get-together where people actually, after the church is removed uh, from the scene, then uh, Satan, the Antichrist, will actually say, now we're going to, uh, to show that the charismatic movement is all of the Lord. We're going to actually have another Pentecost, and he brings fire down from heaven in the sight of men, as the Lord did in Acts chapter 2. I need to say this before I go on. I am certainly not suggesting that all people who speak in tongues or that all uh, folks of that persuasion are of the devil. I am not, I've never said that, and I certainly would not say that now. I would not question the sincerity or the spirituality or the love for Jesus of our Pentecostal brethren, some of which are taking this course, uh, who speak in tongues. I, I do not believe it's for today, and uh, I would condemn the movement. I certainly would not condemn the uh, heart and the attitude of the person who might be caught up in that. Only God can know their heart. But we do know that Satan loves to imitate God. Then he has his sacrifices, just as God has his sacrifices. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20, we're told, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, now the pagan Gentiles he's talking about, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. I think this is a sobering passage, and it reminds us of the uh, other uh, passage in 1 Kings chapter 18, where the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel are uh, jumping up and down on this altar that they have constructed, trying to get Baal to hear them. And what they were doing, they had a sacrifice there, uh, it was an ox that uh, they had slain and laid upon the altar. They were actually sacrificing this offering to Satan himself. They didn't realize it, but that's what they were doing, according to Paul here in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. And then he has his communion. As we have holy communion, fellowship with God, Satan has his unholy communion, his fellowship with his false believers. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2, verse 21, rather, Paul says, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Then he certainly has his armies. Apparently there are some human armies on earth here that are satanic in origin. By that I mean they're composed of human beings, but they're, uh, the, uh, the army itself is organized and energized by Satan. We have an example of this in Ezekiel chapter 37 and chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. The armies there will be from the land of Russia. But that does not mean that Satan will control all Russian people because there are people, I think, in Russia during the tribulation, as in all other the nationalities and nations it would be saved, but the armies themselves, according to Ezekiel 38, God is against, and they invade Palestine, uh, being energized by Satan himself. He has his armies. So we seen these 13 things that would indicate one of the activities of Satan is in imitating God. The second thing that Satan does, he sows tares among God's wheat. He loves to do that. 
One of the clearest parables our Lord told along that line is found in Matthew chapter 13. Actually, this is a number of parables, but in verse 24 of chapter 13, we read this, uh, these words. Another parable put forth he unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, of course, the good seed here is believers, and it could also be the word of God. But in this particular case, it's believers. And uh, the, the, uh, the good man that he speaks about here is himself. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? And of course he said, Yes, I did. Well, from where then hath it tares? And it didn't take the good man of the house long to realize what had happened. And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. I'm going to stop here just for a minute now and discuss this. Who are the tares today? Who are the tares? We're told that Satan is going to sow tares among God's wheat, and that was the message of the parable. Uh, would you be able to recognize a tear? Uh, would you classify Madeline Murray O'Hare <laughs> as a tear? <laughs> now, she's uh, something else, uh, but uh, would you say she's a tear? Would you say that a man like uh, Anton uh, Savander LaVey, who was the head of the First Church of uh, Satan Worship in San Francisco, California, would you say that LaVey is a tear? Would you say that Fidel Castro would be a tear, or that uh, the great atheist that died in 1899, Robert G. Ingersoll, would these be tears? No, one of the characteristics of a tear is that for a while, at least, until the harvest, it looks uh, almost identical, gives the identical appearance to a grain of wheat. Our Lord taught that. Where would you go to find tares? This may be a shock, and some of you pastors, I think, will shout a hearty amen on this, uh, but um, I think probably you would look for tares, not in liberal churches or in taverns, or again, as we said before, in communist cell meetings. I think you would look for tares in Bible-believing, evangelical, conservative, fundamental churches. I think the tares are in such places. Now, it is always a uh, uh, temptation for a pastor when he has uh, trouble with a deacon. And you know they say that a deacon that won't deke is the deacons. And uh, for him to say, well, he's of the devil. And I think sometimes as a pastor I've been prone to do that. And I suppose all men listening to my voice that are pastoring churches, you can identify with this. But, gentlemen, uh, often we're wrong on that, I'm sure. Sometimes it's uh, we're, to, we're to blame as much as the deacons. But uh, seriously, I believe that on occasion, uh, Satan does plant, and perhaps more than we realize, he plants his tares among the wheat of God's fundamental churches. They speak the same language, and uh, they sing the same songs, and they're familiar with the same uh, theology, and yet they've never been born again. Not because they don't know the plan of salvation, not because no one has told them about it, but because they are Satan. Who are the real tares? Someday the uh, question will be asked, will the real tares please stand up? And, of course, the Lord Jesus then, during the harvest, will weed them out from the 
wheat, the wheat will be, the believers will be carried into heaven, and the unsaved, the tares, will be burned up with unquenchable fire, according to the parable here. So he sows tares among God's wheat. The third thing that he does, he instigates false doctrine. No doubt about it, the doctrine of the Jehovah Witnesses, the doctrine of the Mormons, the doctrine of the Christian science, faith, the doctrine of Song Moon, and the doctrine of, well, we can just go on and on, these isms that the church has always been plagued uh, are from Satan himself. He instigates false doctrine. And Paul warns about this, especially in the latter days, as he writes Timothy in chapter 4, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that means to the point, in a detailed fashion, expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So he instigates false doctrine. And then he perverts the word of God. Satan loves to do this. Now, as I told you before, Satan reads the Bible. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And Satan, uh, doubtless to say, has read every single chapter. He may not be a Bible lover, but he is a Bible reader and a Bible believer. Because the, Satan would uh, frown upon higher criticism uh, that he might uh, have people criticize the Bible but, and the critics and everything, but uh, he certainly doesn't believe the garbage that he's uh, energizing them to come up with. Because the Bible says that Satan trembles when he hears the very name of God. He is not a liberal. But he perverts the word of God. He loves to take it out of context. And... Uh, <clears throat> I think we've already mentioned this in Matthew chapter 4. He takes it out of context in the temptation of Jesus. He says, all right, look, uh, you can forget about this Calvary business, and I know that you want to, uh, to secure the worship of men, so all you have to do is just fall down and uh, worship me. And Well, even before that, actually, the temptation, I want it was the second, not the third temptation. He takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, Cast thyself down. He said, For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So he quotes here, of course, from Psalm 91, as we've already discussed in a, another tape, I think. And the point I'm making here, though, that... He was attempting, the devil now, if you please, was attempting to prove his point by quoting Scripture. He was attempting to get Jesus, the Son of God, to sin against God the Father by quoting the Word of God. Satan loves to take the Bible and take it out of context and use it uh, for his own diabolical purposes. And, uh, of course, he does this in Genesis 3, uh, the first temptation. He asks Eve, he said, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? You know, the animals are talking about this. Is it true? It's just hard for me to believe. But did God really say that? And the woman said, Well, uh, yes, he did, really. And uh, so in verse 4 of Genesis 3, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And he goes on to say, But ye shall be as gods, your eyes shall be open, and ye shall know good from evil. Now, in a sense, what he said was true, you see, uh, because they did know good from evil, but they knew it experientially now. God did not want them to know evil from an experiential viewpoint but only from an academic viewpoint. That is to say, I can know something is wrong without actually experiencing that thing. I know taking of LSD is wrong. I've never taken LSD, and I have no desire to take it, but I know academically it's wrong, and I'm not going to uh, take it so I can say experientially I know it's wrong. But what I'm saying is that he, in part, gave Adam and Eve a truth there. Their eyes would be open. He took a part of the Word of God, but he twisted it. 
So he loves to cause the word of God. Uh, he t- takes it out of context. He perverts it. And then he causes it to be misunderstood. Not only taken out of context, but this would naturally lead to a misunderstanding. And you know how much anguish and frustration and confusion and I think lack of faith has the devil wrought throughout the years simply by causing Christians and non-Christians alike to misinterpret, however sincerely, the Word of God. There are thousands of sincere but mistaken Bible readers today, and many are Bible believers, who believe the Scripture teaches the following false concepts because they have misinterpreted the Bible, and I think a lot of that misinterpretation has come from Satan. For example, uh, that a Christian can lose his salvation on the basis of uh, Matthew 24, verse 13. There are other passages that those who do not believe once saved, always saved, could offer, but one is this, that he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And you see, see that proves that uh, the Bible teaches a person can be saved and then lost. But, of course, Matthew 24 is a, a tribulational passage. It deals with the tribulation, and it simply means that those that endure or stand firm, that is to say those that can uh, escape the wrath of Satan, uh, will survive the tribulation. And if you tie that with the Revelation chapter 13, God's going to provide a hiding place for his remnant, Uh, for the last three and a half years of the tribulation, and uh, so they will endure to the end. And uh, there are other passages. I'm uh, looking for one here now. Uh, Let's see. It's in uh, in 1 Peter, I believe, or he speaks of... I mentioned 2 Peter. He speaks of the uh, false teachers, and it says the parable has been, uh, yes, 20, uh, ch- Second Peter chapter 2, verse uh, 22, but it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And so there are those that misinterpret this passage and say, now here this proves you can be saved and lost, because here it says that the dog, it goes back to its vomit, You see, it was removed from a vomit. It goes back to its vomit. And then the sow that was washed to her wallowing again. Well, my only uh, question there is where in the Bible does God ever refer to a believer as a hog or a dog? Now, he calls us a lot of things. He calls uh, calls us the... I am the vine, you're the branches, so he calls us branches. He said, I'm the shepherd, you're the sheep. He refers to us as the elect, as little children, as uh, lambs, as the apple of his eye. He calls us uh, believers. He calls us a number of things, but he never refers to us as hogs or dogs. This whole passage refers here to false teachers, the entire second chapter of Second Peter. And uh, besides that, it says here, that the dog is turned to its own vomit again, and the sow that was washed, and that's literally in the Greek, by the way, the tense of the verb reads, and the sow that washed herself, not was washed, but the sow that washed herself. This is an example of reformation and not regeneration. But by using these verses and other verses, believers then Uh, feel that they can lose their salvation. I want to say this, that if you allow Satan to misinterpret the scriptures along this line and to get you to believe that you can lose your salvation, you will never be an effective soul winner. You simply will not be. I'm not saying it's impossible for an Armenian to win a soul to Christ. I certainly would not say this. But I am saying this, that you cannot be Uh, fully or even partially effective in the work for the Lord and leading other people to Christ if there is some doubt that you yourself are not saved. And I'll discuss the doctrine of eternal security at uh, length when we come to the doctrine of salvation. 
But certainly these verses are misinterpreted and a number of others I could give you, uh, taken out of context, proving that once saved does not ne necessarily mean always saved. And then other passages are misinterpreted. For example, some people read Acts 2.38 and believe that one must be baptized in water in order to be saved. Uh, then Peter asked, said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Of course, uh, I think uh, some of you may know that the important word there is uh, ye shall uh, be baptized in the name uh, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. The little word for can also mean because of. For example, in the, it's a little preposition, and it's the for, it can be translated because of. In, I believe I don't have my notes handy on this, but in, math, in yes, Matthew 12, our Lord Jesus speaks about Jonah preaching to the people in Nineveh. And it said, he says, and they repented because of the preaching of Jonah. Same word used here. So the context could go either way. He could be saying for the remission of sins. In other words, you have to be baptized to be saved. Or he could be saying uh, you need to be baptized as a result of the fact that you have been saved from your sins. Now, if this was the only verse in the Bible, it would be as much my right to interpret it uh, my way as your right to interpret it your way. But there are a number of other passages in the Scripture that would absolutely contradict this. So there should be no misunderstanding. Of all the verses in the Bible, I think the strongest verse to refute baptismal regeneration is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. And here these Corinthian believers were arguing over baptism. And some said, I've been baptized by Paul, and I'm greater than you. And others say, well, Simon Peter baptized me. And uh, anybody that knows anything knows that Simon Peter can preach circles around Paul. And others were saying, I was baptized of Christ. And some were saying, I baptized of Barnabas. And uh, Paul really lowers the boom on them. He said, don't argue and fuss about that. And um, he said in verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius and a few others. In other words, if you're going to argue over that, I'm glad I just baptized a few. Now, this is a remarkable statement. If baptism saves, here Paul is saying, thank God I just led a few of you to Christ. I'm glad I didn't lead any more of you to Christ. But that's in verse 13. But the strongest verse, refuting baptism regeneration, is found in verse 17 where Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, that's a significant statement. What is the gospel? Well, he doesn't even tell us what it is here. When you come to 1 Corinthians 15, he tells us. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But one thing he says it isn't right here. It isn't, has no part whatsoever. Uh, to do with the gospel because Christ did not send him to baptize but to preach the gospel. So whatever the gospel is, it does not include baptism. But there are sincere folks today all over America and all the uttermost parts of the world that still believe that the way of the creek leads home or it's the old rugged creek that saves, but it isn't. It's the way of the cross it's the old rugged cross that leads home. All right, so they've misinterpreted it. And others feel that speaking in tongues, they've, been, they've misinterpreted this passage, is the sign of baptism of the Spirit on the basis of Acts 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. And that is totally taken out of context and, and just absolutely misunderstood. And uh, I'll tell you one of the great misinterpretations of the Bible is uh, a little verse. Actually, I uh, some time ago had a uh, chance to have breakfast with one of the most famous, probably still the most famous faith healer in America today. And uh, he says, he told me and told the group of people on that occasion that uh, he had based his entire healing ministry on one verse in the Bible, 
And that verse is found in the third epistle of John, as it only has one chapter, uh, the second verse of that third epistle. And uh, he, uh, John, is writing to a, a beloved friend by the name of Gaius. And in verse 2, he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. And this uh, faith healer said, uh, I read that and my eyes just about popped out of their sockets. And I determined on the basis of that verse, God was not only calling me to be a preacher, but to be a faith healer as well. I'll tell you, I would want more than one verse in the Bible to direct my calling. But in the first place, that has nothing whatsoever to do with faith healing. He's simply writing, as we would write today, to a dear friend saying, I trust this letter finds you in good health. That's all John is saying. You can read it in the Greek. You can read it in the Latin, the Vulgate. You can read it uh, in uh, Old English in the days of Tyndale. You can read it in Modern English. You can read it in the King James translation. And if you just read it, that's all he's saying. But on that basis and uh, other basis, some believe that it uh, all sick Christians are sinning somewhere along the line because God desires to keep every believer in excellent health. Uh, as based on 3 John uh, chapter 1, verse 2, and then Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And you know, I uh, have just finished making uh, a new study of the book of Job to teach in the Thomas Road Bible Institute, and I've come up with some new notes that we did not get into when I taught uh, the Liberty Home Bible Institute course, but some tapes back on the book of Job. But you know, the I think we did say this, though, when I taught it the first time, that the, uh, the main problem, the great mistake of Job's three friends is that they assumed Job was sinning because their answer was this, Job, we're sorry what you, uh, that you're suffering, but we know that you must be suffering for your sin because God doth not punish righteous people. He does not allow righteous people to suffer. And uh, come on, Job, what's her name? You know, you must be running around with somebody. You have a water gate or a water bed or something, or you're, you've stolen some money, or you've cheated on your income tax. God doesn't punish or allow righteous people to suffer. Well, I'm not sure that uh, is true. Uh, you know, he sort of allowed Jesus to suffer, didn't he? And you might say Jesus was righteous. Oh, I'll tell you, one of the biggest lies from the pit of hell is the lie that says if a believer is ill, it must mean he's sinning or doesn't have the faith to be saved. And some time ago I talked to a dear woman uh, who uh, a godly woman had raised children in the mission field and and uh, she uh, was suffering terribly from cancer and, and she'd been listening to a faith healer, some quack from one of the southern states, and he was telling her uh, that, uh, and everybody was listening, that uh, she could be healed or they could be healed by sending in for a prayer cloth. It was not God's will that any Christian suffer. And I thought to myself, as I knew the background of that godly woman, uh, this dear saint here has more spirituality and more knowledge about Christ and more love for the Savior in her little finger than that big fake does in his entire body. Oh, how the devil can pervert the word of God by taking it out of context and by causing us to misinterpret it. On this basis, or uh, on this note, I should say, we'll end this lecture and begin... Uh, we'll continue on with the next then.